good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Board. We've got um, two apologies from Martin Longley and Byron Quayle, Councillor Byron Quayle. Um, the first item on the agenda is to elect a chairman for the move for the year 2023 to 24. Um, do I have any nominations for chairman? You do. Councillor Flower. Thank you very much, George. I'd like to propose uh, Jane Somper to be chairman of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And is there a seconder for that nomination? Councillor Brooks, thank you. Is there any other nominations? No. In that case, Councillor Somper. Yeah, you should have tapped on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, right, OK, so now we move on to agenda item three with the election of vice chairman. So um, I would uh, like to uh, nominate Patricia Miller. Um, do I have a seconder? You do. Thank you, Councillor Flower. Are there any other nominations for vice chairman? Nope, OK, thank you. <laughs> right, uh, uh, move on to item number four. Um, are there any declarations of interest? No, thank you. OK, uh, item number five um, are the minutes. Can I confirm the minutes of the meeting held on, gosh, the 15th of March this year? Everybody happy with those? Yes, I can sign those. Later, anyone on? No, OK. Um, there are um, item number six. Uh, there are no uh, questions from the public. Um, and item number seven, there are no uh, questions from members. And I think that's something that not having questions from public and members is something that would be good to address moving forward. Try to kind of expand the knowledge of, of, of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, Ah, uh, uh, item number eight, urgent items, there are none. Um, and item number nine, um, we move into the work programme. Are you going to? Um, Sam. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so I just wanted to open up discussion on this session because remember on the 15th of March and at that far we took a paper on the integrated care partnership strategy but as part of that discussion one of the recommendations in the paper was for the health wellbeing board's development session the purpose of that development session was to look at some of the new responsibilities going through because of the change in legislation established integrated care system so the health and wellbeing board has a particular role um, in sort of assessing the degree of fit between the integrated care partnership strategy, the NHS joint forward plan, to what extent that reflects health and wellbeing board priorities. So it's important that we start to build that into the forward work plan of the health and wellbeing board. There are also some responsibilities around joint strategic needs assessment. So in the legislation it says Every time the Health and Wellbeing Board receives an important piece of joint strategic needs assessment, then we should reflect on that. And if there are any strategic issues that need to be fed through into some of those other plans, the board has a role in bringing that to the fore and also uh, looking at the opportunity to refresh um, plans and strategies, including the ICP strategy. We haven't really worked like that up, up till now. We've tended to have an annual summary of JSNA that comes to the Health and Wellbeing Board. But I can think of at least one piece of work in joint strategic needs assessment, which is looking at mental health at the moment, mm -hmm. which I think the Health and Wellbeing Board should take a keen interest in, not least because there's also a piece of transformation work going on around the change in community mental health services. So there's a there's a programme that the NHS is leading called the Mental Health Integrated Community Care Programme. Have I got that right, Patricia? Yeah. So I think if we could start to um, look at the opportunity to populate this work program going forward with some of that business as usual work, that would be a, a good place to start. But until we've got a date for the development session, I think the rest of the work um, needs to come out of the discussions from that session. That's OK. So we'll provide a bit of an intro 
to what the new responsibilities of the board are. And it's a good chance to look at the ICP strategy and reflect on what we want to do when we're starting to reshape the, uh, the, the health and wellbeing strategy. And that's the final thing that probably needs to be on the forward plan is a timescale for refreshing the health and wellbeing plan. Um, so that was my opening pitch really, Chairman. I'm happy to take other comments and questions. Tricia. Thank you, Chair. There's just one comment from me, which is really happy with some suggestions. So thank you. You press your buttons. I don't use this one to technology, see. In our boardroom, it just happens. Um, the only thing I was thinking that we can make a decision on the place leadership teams. The, the target at the moment is that they step up and operate in shadow format from July, but I think in reality we'll probably get there a bit sooner. So whether very early in the new calendar year, we want to just have take stock of where they are and get an update on that because we did agree in putting their um, ICP strategy together that the Health and Wellbeing Board would hold the ring on place and make sure it delivers. So I think that's probably a good time for you to get sight of the early thinking on what the priorities might be and the delivery plan so that we can all get assurance that it aligns with the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy and the ICP strategy. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and I, I apologise because I, I assumed that everybody knows everybody, so I didn't do the introduction and seeing how many people are here and on screen, I think would take quite a long time, so I apologise for that. Um, I think that's that's the way forward. I, I think the have you got the list of those? That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, I, the other thing uh, that I wanted to uh, talk about was the membership of the board. Um, so there are some um, people or organisations who are on here. Um, should they remain on here? And are there others who perhaps aren't on here that we might consider? Um, and uh, you won't have all had sight of those. So I think if we could supply that, George, to everyone to 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 take away and to think about. So, for instance, uh, the CCG accountable officer. Um, well, it exist anymore, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and there are others. So you know, is it strong enough in some areas? Um, you know, there are uh, three from locality executive teams from the GPs. Um, I'm not sure if Simone is on. No. Um, so you know, and there's questions around that. Are there enough? Is it enough? those sorts of questions so if we could send that out to board members so we can have you know and then think about that and have that discussion i i think that's important i think is there anything else Anybody? i think that would be really helpful and maybe we need to think about um representation at neighborhood level yeah got the right people in the room for, and we've probably got five pcns in the west Yeah, well, that's that side. I'm thinking sort of leading up to the Dorset Council boundary. We've got more, haven't we? So we yeah. might just want to think about how mm. they're represented. You know, there's a danger, isn't there, as well, if you have too many people? Then, but um, I'm very want... happy to talk to kind of get through Betty Alliance. Uh, I'm very happy. I'll start again <laughs> to talk to uh, uh, the uh, primary care through the GP Alliance about um, how they best uh, want to. Uh, want to make sure that they are contributing and members of the of the board. That's fine. I'll take. I'll do that. Brilliant. Okay. And I don't know if there's a discussion also around when there are particular issues that come up. It might be dental. It might be. Oh, I don't know. Optometry. Thank you. Yes. Or the the. <laughs> If if then somebody could be invited, an individual invited to particular board meetings when there are 
those topics on there. I think that would also be helpful. They don't have to sit permanently, um, but you want the experts in, in the room, in my opinion. OK, um, is there anything else um, on that point? No, OK, uh, so then we can move on to uh, the Better Care Fund um, and that is Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Have you pressed your green button? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm just going to share my screen. Presentation coming up. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Sewell. I'm head of service for older people with commissioning. Um, I've just got the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, approval required today for the Better Care Fund year end report. So just a couple of slides just to take you through um, to support the uh, information in, in the report pack today. Oh, bear with me, my screen's stuck. There we go. So I just thought a, a, another quick reminder um, on, on the Better Care Fund. So um, it's a key funding stream um, for all local systems and in Dorset it provides the council and Dorset NHS with a total of 100 44 million pounds um, and that um, amount for last year did include a late arrival of some money through the adult social care discharge fund which um, if you recall we brought back the approval to the last meeting just around um, how we spent those monies um, there's a requirement from the BCF uh, around the plans uh, being co-produced and, and we work closely with Dorset NHS in order to do that um, so, so we co-produce those plans with um, aligned priorities and there's sets of mandatory conditions um, for how we invest those monies and perform measures you have to report against and, and prove our performance. Um, the, PC, uh, the BCF uh, policy objectives do echo our local shared um, priorities, and that's around enabling people to stay well, safe and independent at home for longer and providing the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, and in addition to submitting annual plans for how we propose to spend the money every year, and we also have to send um, a year end summary about how we the, just sort of prove that we've, we've spent in line with our plan. So we submitted um, that under delegated authority um, back in May. So we're seeking formal approval from the board today. Um, just in terms of how our performance against um, BCF metrics, so there's been some really good performance and we've met targets around avoidable, avoidable admission and discharge to normal place of residence. And I just thought it might be useful just to give a couple of insights as to um, areas that are really supporting those two targets. So we have um, a pilot in place around a Medicare, um, which is um, a virtual clinical um, tool which helps care homes um, access that clinical support and is really um, there's a lot of really positive feedback from the care homes that are included in that pilot and really good outcomes for people being able to uh, to remain in their care homes and also um, care homes are more confident in receiving people back from hospital because they've got that additional clinical support there should that person deteriorate um, so some really positive um, work in that space that's supporting those targets. Also some work that we've done uh, to recommission our block contracted home care really make that to really make that recovery focused. Um, and again, we know that that's helping um, those admission avoidance. We've extended the criteria so that it's not just about discharge from hospital through that scheme. We're also supporting um, those admission avoidance scenarios and, and community crisis as well. And we have a trusted assessor service, which we started as a pilot um, back in uh, Dorchester County Hospital probably nearly two years ago now that we've now rolled out um, across the Dorset community um, hospitals as well and, and again that's really helping with that discharge to normal place of residence and there's some um, responsive work that the TAs do going down to the emergency departments to help turn people around and prevent admission. Um, so I just wanted to also flag we've got some opportunities we believe to broaden how we use the Medicare um, in our care homes and there's an opportunity to extend that to all the care homes in Dorset. We obviously need to look at funding but that's something that we're really keen to look at um, and also understand how that sort of technology can help home care providers as well and that will really strengthen um, the offer that we have for people um, to remain to remain at home and again looking at how we can um, have a more formal and uh, stronger investment line around um, those RCR contracts as well. So they're kind of key areas that we'd expect to see in our BCF plan that we bring back to you um, for approval um, at the next board. 
So in terms of um, areas for improvements, we, we, we didn't make our, uh, meet our target around the rate of permanent admissions to residential care. However, that's like many other um, ICBs across the country where we were, we were relying more um, in the last financial year um, around having care home placements in order to, to discharge people from hospital, particularly around the lack of home care. Um, we saw those pressures in the market areas uh, sort of quarters one to three of the last financial year and actually when we when we got to quarter four and um, the last sort of six weeks we were really starting to see an improving picture of home care and I'm, I'm pleased to report that where we are now we're continuing to see that that building capacity and um, so we've, we've got the right uh, checks and balances in place to, to address that as we go into the period. We also have the Home First Accelerator Programme, um, which is a joint investment piece, which again is looking to improve um, our reavement offer for the people of Dorset um, and optimise home care capacity. So we have the right resources in the right places to support people to remain um, independent and at home for as long as possible. Um, and then finally, in terms of our um, our other metric, which is around reavement performance, and this measures the percentage of people who remained at home after 91 days following um, discharge from hospital who have been supported through our reavement um, service. So we're just slightly off target um, in this area, um, but we've con we have we know that this is um, in relation to um, our transfer of provision from our to our new local authority trading company. So just pre and, and post transition in the transitional period, um, we had some difficulties gathering the data and so we therefore have reported a lower performance than we'd expected. Um, we have an action plan in place for that with Care Dorset and performance at the end of the last quarter um, is rising to, to meet that forecast. So we are expecting that improvement um, as we go into the next period. So I just thought it might be useful just to give you a flavour of the work that we're doing at the moment to prepare for um, the next plan, which is this year we're, we're moving into that two year planning cycle. Um, so we're going to bring that plan to the next Health and Wellbeing Board and we're in the process of currently finalising um, that working jointly with um, Dorset NHS commissioners uh, to, to define that plan. Um, the key focus um, for us, one of the key focuses for us in linking into to Sam's points earlier is how um, the integrated care partnership and in particular thriving communities is strongly linked in the BCF. Um, and the other priority areas for us, um, as we've spoken about previously, is about widening um, all age commissioning. Um, so we, we widen that support for that for that all age kind of cohort. Um, and we've got areas around um, all age carers development that we're, we're currently looking at and also joint commissioning arrangements to support the birth to settled adulthood, a, tongue, a mouthful, birth to settled adulthood programme. Um, and we've got additional investments um, to, to add into the BCF around our Home First, I mentioned the Home First Accelerator programme, so really starting to develop that intermediate care offer. And um, another priority area just to add in there is um, the budget building that we'll need to do it as we start to agree the new schemes that will include the BCF, how we start to build those into our future plans. So just to come back to the recommendation um, for today, so um, I am seeking a retrospective approval of the Better Care Fund year end template for the last financial year. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, are there any questions, comments? Uh, it's Margaret, Margaret Guy from Healthwatch Dorset. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about support for carers. Mm -hmm. I think it's crucial for actually enabling people to be discharged. Yeah. You'll be aware of the report that we published last autumn that demonstrated the importance of involving carers in, in that whole pathway. And I, I couldn't see very much about carers in the template, but maybe that's because yeah. of the restrict, you know, the, the, um, the you know, you're constri constrained by what the template required yeah. of you. But I just felt in the next plan how much support there's going to be for carers. Yes, yeah, so you'll see in the narrative plan that we build, that we bring back, um, so the, the planning that we do at the beginning of the sort of financial cycle is, has much more detail and that picks up a lot around carers. So we have this many different um, rafts of support, particularly in relation to hospital discharge. We've recently invested um, into some carers caseworkers that are actually working in hospital sites. Right. So really linking in with carers and being able to support and help planning. And we've got a we've sort of strengthened that carers workers support with a with a lead um, area practice manager to really strengthen the practice and and look to how we can support 
um, those individuals and help with the planning and signposting to the different routes that are available once the person, once the cared for person leaves hospital. So I can share with you some more detail on that, if that would be of help, but you will see a big section in our narrative plan um, when, when we bring that in, indeed, that was in that in the plan last year as well. Yes, I remember there was something in the, yeah. yes. Would you yeah. like to extend that? That would be very helpful. Yes, yes thank you. Patricia. Um, I just wanted to thank Dorset Council colleagues, actually, because um, <clears throat> I think we've worked really well together in the last few months on the Hospital Discharge Fund and how we get better value out of the Better Care Fund. And we've seen a significant reduction in people who are um, delayed in hospital because they can't get out. And that's a really important improvement in quality and morbidity and mortality for, for those people. So, um, yeah, fantastic job. Uh, we're moving at pace on it. Um, we we need to talk, we need to get the same sort of initiatives moving as fast in the east, but just things like the trusted assessor mm -hmm. made such a massive difference. Uh, the extra beds that are being provided in the community, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're moving towards discharge to assess, it all makes a huge difference to the quality of life that people have very quickly. They get out of hospital and get on with their normal lives. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And that, yes, you're right. It it it. It does show what can be done. Sorry, um, come in. Oh, thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you. So, I, um, I mean, I, I was thinking that also the thing to then add is actually that's hugely beneficial in our relationship and our working with our acute providers um, um, because they can see some of that action happening out of the community and, and then that allows us to work with them around their internal pathways. And so that's worked really well. I guess if we are being really honest with ourselves, there's a little bit about sometimes we're getting in too late, so we're doing the step down from hospital. So, so I guess it's it's really having a focus. What can the better? How can the better care fund be a, um, a an enabler for us in that step up space? And I know there's things so in Medicare and things like that are really good examples of that. But how can we push that? Um, particularly planning ahead of ahead of this winter, mm. um, because actually the best thing around reducing the long-term morbidity impacts of someone when they get ill is keeping them at home wherever possible um uh, so so i guess that's a that's a challenge we collectively own mm -hmm. but it's just the bcf is often a useful tool to to be able to do that um, can, I, can i think get used to this by the end of the meeting won't we <laughs> um, okay um i think we've got in relation to kind of that admission avoidance and i, I know potentially once somebody has support from a from a but a formal form of support it is it's, it's too late it's too late however there's an appetite from the provider market to want to to be involved in how we can support admission avoidance and just talking about it, medicare there is real interest in how we can look to use that differently and our provider association who hosts the ta service they're really um infused by the opportunities that it offers so we're kind of pushing on an open door really i guess is what i'm saying Any any other comments? No, uh, I would uh, just say so. This is a re retrospective, obviously, and next time uh, you, you're coming here, will it, that also be retrospective? It will, yeah. So the aim is to eventually align. Yes. So there's a natural feed in. Okay. I I, I appreciate it's difficult because it's sort of starting backwards, but we aim. Ah, Richard. Hello, thank you. So um, it is my first meeting, Sir Richard Bell, the LPA commander uh, for uh, Dorset County area. Uh, it's just in relation to that policy. I, I just want to make you aware of the Right Care, Right Person uh, policing programme, which is uh, it's subject to College of Policing uh, development. You will have some local consultation, but probably a national launch around about September, which uh, removes reliance on policing for quite quite significant areas of work in relation to mental health, uh, welfare checks uh, and social care provisions. So I don't know how that will impact upon you and whether you're aware of that and built that into your, your plan. Uh, you would have seen that the Met Police probably referred to it last month. Um, uh, in, a, in an interview as they're going live with it, I think it's this June. FRS uh, are promoting it 
and it was referred to, I think, in the State of the Nation for policing uh, only this month. Thank you. Yes, obviously we were aware. I've had uh, brought it up with the officers here when I uh, read about the um, decision by the Met, so um, we knew it would be coming. Patricia. Um, so I was at a national, have I been at two different national meetings this week? Uh, well, one last week and one this week to talk talk about this. Um, I don't I don't think we won't be going live in September in Dorset, very doubt that. And actually the work we've done with Gavin, who's the lead for Dorset Police, is that it's probably going to take about 12 months to get us into the right place to be able to do this um, so that the safety of individuals is not affected. Um, we, the national position is that there is no agreement on the date that, that Lund, the Met will go live. There's still some ongoing negotiations between them and NHS England. It is likely that the formal policy document will be out in September, but it will be up to individual uh, systems and the local police force and partners to agree the implementation and, and phasing of that. And as I said, the conversations we've had with Gavin is at the earliest it will be a year. Um, at worst, it will be 18 months, but it depends on how quickly we get on top of the workforce issues that we've got. If we're able to um, recruit to key post both in health and social care, then we can go we can go forward much quicker. So it's, it's just to manage that. So, so whilst we might not formally go live for 12 to 18 months, I think you'll start to see a cultural change moving far more quickly than that. Uh, and you'll probably see, like I said, that hopefully the engagement um, from, from Gavin, as you said, um, will start happening in earnest because uh, HMI CFRS will probably start to hold us to account for how we manage the demand. And we are due to be inspected next April. I understand that, but my point is, if we if we agree between us a go live date that is is accepted, that's what we can't have as a cultural change that moves away from that. We've either we either agree a process for transitioning or we don't. So the whole point of the work with Gavin is to agree actually with Dorset uh, Police uh, what that transition time is and how we're going to manage it in between time. Theresa. Thank you. And um, just to kind of ensure that colleagues are clear, because I'm worried that we're going to get into some confusions around this, Richard, the responsibility for safeguarding in terms of young people remains a triumphal activity. And so this, this change doesn't cover those young people. And I think we need to be really mindful about that because it is complex for our frontline staff to be getting one message around one thing and one around another. So uh, the working together at the time remain the same at the present time and I don't think they'll change as the review goes on this year but it remains the responsibility of health police and the local authority to work together um, around that so I think I just wanted to underscore that for our young people really. It, it does but in particular missing uh, the initial considerations will be uh, what agencies have done in order to um, identify or try to find that individual before policing is required to, to intervene and progress it. So, so, so there are there are some subtleties uh, which will have quite significant implications. Yeah, and, and that will be for you to do your risk assessment around that in terms of liability and responsibility. And I think that's kind of the work we're saying needs to happen between now and then really, is for us to be really clear uh, together about how we work together in that. Because that way we'll, we won't be um, passing this between us, but we'll be working to make sure that we help and link arms together so children and Ron Bladdock don't fall through the gaps. Thank you, Teresa. Any other comments on that? So that clearly is something that we are going to, as Teresa said, be linking arms on and working very closely uh, together uh, to see how that is going to, what that's actually going to mean, what's going to need to be put in place, um, and the, the risks that that entails. So we need to be and thinking. To, I'm honest, I think it, I'm real disappointed with it. Yeah. Um, I think as part of the Patricia Hewitt review, one of the things we highlighted really strong was the need for central government departments to work together. Mm -hmm. And finding that we've got a situation where all public services are really stretched and are not being able to do their mandate. And then we have, a, we have a directive where one partner pulls. It's really difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really disappointed that that's where we found ourselves as a, as a, as a group of national public services. But we are where we are and now we've got to deal with it. 
Right. Um, yeah, are there any other uh, questions? Did the recommendation was to, sorry, just, uh, to retrospectively approve the BCF end of year template for 22-23. We're all happy with that. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, we now move on to the pharmaceutical needs assessment supplementary statement. And is Jane online for this? Just calling her in. Okay, thank you. Hello, Jane. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. Right, do you want to um, introduce the uh, uh, document? The report, okay, so assessment. Yes, of course. So um, just uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read the document. So just uh, very briefly, the pharmaceutical needs assessment is a health and wellbeing board responsibility. And the legislation is quite specific around what's required in a pharmaceutical needs assessment and it's focused on managing the entry of pharmacies to the market so it's very focused on that um, our last uh, pharmaceutical needs assessment was published in october 2022 and in dorset and because of the icb arrangements that we have in place we did that as a joint pharmaceutical needs assessment for the whole area of the icb um, so covering both um, bcp and the dorset council health and wellbeing board footprints we have seen changes since the PNA was published, um, lots of changes um, with Lloyd selling off or closing a number of their pharmacies, including all of their pharmacies that are inside Sainsbury's, all that, although that predominantly impacts on the BCP area, um, which has seen three closures. So Dorset Council hasn't seen that same level of change, although there's been some changes of ownership and there is some still some ongoing uh, discussions uh, with Lloyd's um, Pharmacy still trying to sell some of their uh, existing pharmacies. So there may be some further changes to come. So the reason for bringing it here really, in drafting the supplementary statement, which is a statement of fact, um, I realised we didn't have delegated authority to publish that without uh, agreement through the board. So that's one of the things that we're asking for is delegated authority to do these um, when required. Um, <coughs> And as I say, we are expecting further changes ahead, so I am expecting that we will have to do further supplementary statements uh, sort of in the course of the year. Where there are these kinds of changes, it is the responsibility of the pharmacies to communicate about those changes um, with their customers. And NHS England were the commissioners, um, although this has now been delegated to NHS Dorset. And so some of the processes will continue as they currently are based on legislation, but we are in, I am in discussion with um, colleagues within the ICB about some more flexibility, about thinking more broadly for the next PNA, about whether we can exploit um, other opportunities to use the sort of PNA and, and expand how that actually, the utility of it, so that we can look more at some of the other community pharmacist roles in communities and sort of how we connect with neighbourhood teams, those kinds of things to make it a more valuable um, document for ourselves. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jane. Are there any? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, we've had at Health Watch Dorset, we've had um, some issues raised with us where people have had difficulty accessing pharmacies mm -hmm. due to short pharmacies clearing that short notice due to staff shortages and I wasn't sure whether that was something that should be being covered by the PNA is it um and whether so our manager was asking if it was something that could be included in the survey that you do ahead of the next one just to get to tease and it's in various parts it's they all seem to be boots pharmacies that we've had issues with i mean i know we've had a lot of problems in swanage as well so but if this is basically that um a pharmacist doesn't turn up on the day and so the pharmacy has to close and uh, so I just don't know how widespread a problem that is and whether that's something we should also be capturing information about. 
So certainly that did come out in the consultation in the with the PNA last time. So although in theory it is only about the market entry, we did include a recommendation for the ICB to, um, you know, they are already doing work about the community pharmacist role and community pharmacist um, uh, increase in the numbers of community pharmacists. So it was really to um, put a little bit more emphasis on that and, and maybe up the pace on that if, if at all possible. Um, so that was included as a recommendation in the PNA last time, but clearly that's something that we would want to expand on for the next one. Um, and I think just for oh. it's helpful. <laughs> it's helpful from, uh, from just to understand how this fits within the ICB. So we've now taken on delegated commissioning of uh, community pharmacy, and I think that gives us an opportunity to match up the the needs assessment with the quality of service that's being provided mm -hmm. and also to build on those it's not just about prescription dispensing it's about those wider things and those wider clinical services that that can be offered so so i think it's a really it's a really good opportunity to bring the needs assessment together with some of the quality uh, work that we and, and and additional service work that we'll be doing with pharmacists as, as the commissioner so um so i think that's a there's a space for that to happen. And I think, Jane, just checking that you are, I, I, I'm sure you are linked in with our commissioning teams to try and pull those two things together. Yeah, I'm linking with Fiona and Catherine. Yeah. Plugged in with Patricia. Um, and I think that there's a national shortage of pharmacists, so yes. it's not, that's not going to go away. But there is there is a national lobby at the moment to try and get the department to change the responsibility of the pharmacy technician so they don't dispense. That's an ongoing conversation because that will take the pressure off uh, the limited number of qualified pharmacists that we've got. But there is an intention nationally to uh, increase the number of training places. We just need to work on making sure we're creating the right opportunities mm -hmm. for them. And we talked at the commissioning committee this morning about the fact that that's where the wider partnership comes in because some of the difficulty of recruiting is making sure that we've got affordable housing. Yeah. And it's also about making sure that where people are thinking of taking up residences for pharmacy, that we've got good schools because otherwise we won't get young people who just qualified to come and take up our space. Mm. Any other comments? No. Uh, Jane, thank you. Um, so the recommendation is to approve the publication of the. Oh, sorry, there was one thing around the second um, recommendation, which was to delegate authority to the consultant in public health to publish further supplementary statements as required. And I just wanted if, if also the board could be updated of any changes as and when they happen, please. Yes, we can that. ensure that those get circulated or put on future agendas as a from information item. Would you like to propose it? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. I would like to propose that as an amendment. Yeah. If, yes, happy with that and happy with the and the second that I need. Please someone. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Brilliant. OK, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, just need to make sure I want to prove something Second, and I wasn't allowed to. I had to do it all over again. Um, so we're happy to approve these two recommendations. That we don't have all those problems. <laughs> Anybody could agree to it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, so we will um, now move on uh, to um, item number twelve, which is thriving communities. And we have Sam here in the room and we have Cherry Brooks here, Councillor Brooks here as well. So Sam, would you like to? Thank you. Present? Thank you, Chair. So I didn't introduce myself before, but oh, I'm Sam, sorry. Sam Crow, Director of Public Health for Dorset Council, but also for BCP Council. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce this paper. Once I've kind of run over some of the key points and some of the background, I'll invite colleagues to come in as well, including Councillor Brooks. Um, so this really, I think is a good opportunity to look at, um, I guess, kickstarting what I think of as some of our place-based partnership work. And 
going back in time, we had a, an underspend on the public health grant from 21-22. We decided in advance of the integrated care system legislation to uh, allocate 309,000 as part of the return of that grant to Dorset Council and to BCP Council. And at the time, the Joint Public Health Board supported that, recognising that this was to really kickstart place-based working. I think now is the right time. So we brought a proposal forward through the Health and Wellbeing Board today that I've worked up in part with colleagues from adult social care, particularly John Price. And it speaks to ambition around the integrated care partnership strategy, not just the thriving community's ambition, which is priority two, but also about how we start to change the culture of how we've been working in the system so far. So the story in a nutshell is we hear lots and lots of tales of the way the system might kick in in a reactive way when particularly older people start to run into perhaps health problems or health issues. And as I've already heard through the Better Care Fund paper today, that can lead people to be admitted, sometimes inappropriately, but often it's the start of a, a real step change in their loss of independence. Um, so for a number of years, public health has been interested in whether we can draw on the strength of the voluntary and community sector in developing proactive networks of support. And if we can reach people earlier and build on their strengths and understand some of the things that keep them well, some of the things that keep them living independently in their community, and that's a far better use of our resources, far better for the person, um, that would be a very, very different model. And I think it's fair to say that there are pockets in Dorset where that works very well. So the links between primary care, voluntary sector organisations, people working and volunteering in practices are particularly strong. Uh, but certainly my observation, I don't know about colleagues' observations, is that's not always consistent. And I don't think we're yet at the point where we have a consistent model that's applied you know, throughout Dorset. There have been other ideas that I know have been explored through the Population Health Management Programme about developing uh, more proactive care records, anticipated care, care records that don't just capture records of what's happened to people, but are more importantly capturing social needs, you know, what, what really keeps a person well. Um, so there are lots of strands of work that this touches on. And one of the other projects which we've led on, which the paper refers to, was a programme of work which was led by an organisation called All Together Better. And I just wanted to kind of bring that before the Health and Wellbeing Board. That was a programme of work that we started under the Prevention at Scale programme. It was going very successfully and up until the pandemic. Um, but the learning from that program was that it doesn't necessarily work in all areas. So we have got experience of what are the conditions that create that uh, or, or lead that model to thrive. Um, so this piece of work is really about undertaking a bit of a baseline assessment, trying to look at what work exists out there already. What's the capability and the capacity of the voluntary community sector what, what sort of conditions lead them to be able to develop those strong networks and perhaps where are the parts of Dorset where we need to do more work to kind of bolster that. So it's going to be a multi-stage approach. We've been quite careful not to make any uh, particular uh, prescriptive recommendations about what that support to the sector might, might involve. I think it's really important that we start to gather uh, a proper reference group that can inform that work and that's the work that Jerry hopefully will be involved in leading. So we'll play a key role in convening those discussions around how do we build that strength. Um, so I didn't want to say too much more today other than my ask, apart from the recommendation, is that the Health and Wellbeing Board leaders will go back to your organisations and, and really create a little bit of interest around this project. Um, we're going to feel our way into it. I think it's really important that we take that hitch approach. So you'll see in the paper there's a very clear timeline around starting to scope the project. Um, we're being quite careful not to make assumptions around this, but I think we'll just bring regular reports back to the Health and Wellbeing Board. And I think it's the first building block really in hopefully starting to reorient the way that we're working as a system to embed that preventive, proactive culture. Um, and also to, to recognise that we, we need to do that flexibly. So there will be different approaches required in different areas. What works in one area is definitely not going to work in another. Mm. So I'm happy to um, pause there and perhaps invite Councillor Brooks. Uh, yes. Just, as, as Sam says, 
um, we know that there's stuff going on at the moment, and we know that we need to do some work to to help cliff edges when it gets to the care sector, but we're not exactly sure where it is, why it is, how it is in each of the different pockets across Dorset. So I think that's our first um, stage of this is to actually do some work to find out what's going on, what's successful, can it be moved across into other areas, uh, what the resources would be needed, what the infrastructure would be. So it's all a little bit what if at the moment, but the further we get into it, uh, the more we will know which direction we're needing to travel. And that is why we're asking for you to sort of create some interest in your organisation so that when we come to you, um, people are already uh, ready for it and, and willing to engage and to help us because uh, we're going to need lots of different levels of expertise on this, feeding into it. So, um, yeah, it's exciting. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> There's an action there for us. Yes, Patricia. Ooh, quite excited now. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you know, Dawn, that we're lead for engagement. So there's, there's things going through my mind is um, in the last few days, um, well, first of all, I've been invited to this round, very small round table in, the, in a few weeks, which is with an organisation called, I think it's called the Round Tree, and it has quite a lot of VCAC organisations. It's a bit like... Um, um, you know, you've got the organisation where I can't remember what it's called, the, the Russell Group, where the top university It's very similar, but for VCSE sector, you've got really big charity that you've got really small. What they want to talk about is what can they do as a sector to really support ICSs to thrive? So there's that. I'm thinking about how we use whatever comes out of that. And then this week, I've, I've made contact with four other ICSs that I know are really forward thinking. Because one of our nets has got 30 years experience in the third sector, but more importantly, the last few years has been at a, a really senior level where she's got quite a lot of contacts with businesses and philanthropists who would be willing to put millions into our system if we had the right things to work on. Mm -hmm. And we've had a conversation as five ICSs about focusing on prevention and early health. So we've got a meeting scheduled in the next two or three weeks, which I'll invite you to, Sam. Because if we can find some things that we can have some common threads on when you on the baseline assessment, then I think we'll very easily be able to attract quite a lot of money uh, to seed some of these things if we can create the right narrative. That does sound exciting. John. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah, I mean, really exciting, really important piece of work. So I'm grateful to Sam and Cherry for the work that's going, to see and going forward. Um, two observations, mate. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively modest sum of money. I think mm -hmm. we just always be clear about that. Mm. And therefore, picking up that second part that uh, everybody who's spoken has made clear that actually um, behoves us more importantly, I sense, is the match, the, the in kind contribution that will come by us all playing our part and, and actually supporting Sam. So, we, just to bring those. Uh, two things together, at least in my mind, very clear in the recommendation. It's about the role of this board in overseeing that work going forward. So I think if we could, Chairman, I would be encouraged to very much take that part of the recommend recommendation to heart and recognising that our monitoring, we're not only sort of looking over and seeing what's going on, but actually just that making sure that, 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 that Sam and Jerry and others are getting all of our collective support. Because I think reality very is keen for that, John. The success will be in that bit of it. So I mm -hmm. think, as I say, a fairly small sum of money spent very wisely, but the test is going to be can we all make sure we do sort of step in and really make a reality of mm -hmm. what we've set out to do in the strategy? Exactly. Paul. Uh, uh, thank you. So, so again, I think I, I think it sounds really exciting. So, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, my deputy director for inequalities would wrap my knuckles if I didn't mention health inequalities. Um, it's not mentioned in the paper. And I guess the reason I raise, raise it is often communities that are uh, in the best position to make the most of this opportunity don't necessarily map across the communities that most need it. And so, so it's how you use this as an enabling fund and piece of work to try and make sure it gets to those places where it really does. Um, uh, Secondly, she's just put a bid in for uh, community connected uh, money to come through from NHS England, so it would map across. So that's really, really well. So make sure that you link in with her. Um, 
Uh, there was a third point about what you said then, but it's gone completely out of my mind. It can't have been that important. Comes back to you. I'll press the button. Don't blame it on menopause, <laughs> Brian, anyway, can you? Thank you. <laughs> Teresa and then Simon. Sorry, I don't know which order it was, but I, si uh, Teresa's looming larger at me. <laughs> On the screen. It was definitely Simon, though. So I don't know, Simon, if you want to come in then. Okay. Hey, yeah, thank you. So I'm actually a member of this board as a representative for the sector. So it's brilliant to hear the the focus that's being proposed here. Um, I do agree with the earlier comment that it's a relatively modest sum of money, but it's a step in the right direction. But one thing I was um, interested to look at when I read through the paper was you've got a huge body of people there in the voluntary sector that are doing a tremendous amount of work, particularly in the more deprived areas of across the region. Um, and with, you're talking about them, but I don't really see any engagement with them at this stage. And you've got some great organizations out there you've got can you've got others you've got ourselves dorset community action we have over 300 members across dorset so it would be lovely to see somewhere in that plan how you look to engage i did see something about engaging through pcns but um i think that would be missing a large a large element of what the voluntary sector can actually do in this space Chairman, can I just can I just answer that? Thank you. Um, one of the uh, one of the really key things that I have always done in in my career, if we've been doing things like this, is that we involve the people that are going to be affected. Um, at that po at at this point, I don't know when that will need to happen, but you can be assured that that will it will be part of what we look at. We won't just do two, we will evolve, yeah? Thank you. Teresa. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad I let Simon go first because I wanted to just kind of reference some work and engagement that we have been involved in, in crafting the new 10-year Children's uh, Strategic Alliance for Children and Young People plan. And there's been a significant amount of involvement in the voluntary sector there. I don't think the plan is referenced in the report, but it is where we need to make sure that we link together in terms of that work that we've already set those key priorities for children and families um, with our voluntary sector colleagues and others and i just again wanted to um, alert people to the hopeful and i think again similar principle tricia around a organization called five at five who are presently operating in the stoke-on-trent space run by ada cable um, and very keen to work with us on portland and think about how we support the people of Portland supporting their children to thrive at five. And that would all be about uh, entrepreneurial money, not um, not even much funding at this point. So we'll continue to kind of feed that through. It's, 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 a, it's a feature of our strategic alliance for children and young people. Um, and that report will just be, it's just signed off by the board last month and will be available to people in hard copy and digitally once it comes back to the printers this week. Good, thank you. Is there anyone else? Any other comments? Sam, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Every so I'll just come back on. There's some really helpful comments made to help us shape the paper, and I'll come back to um, not an excuse really, but the, the plea is this really is at a very, very early stage. So, Simon, you're absolutely right. Um, we do need to carry out some proper engagement and work with the communities and organisations. I guess in mitigation, this idea came out of the ICP strategy work and a lot of engagement working with and through CAN and help and kindness. We've got the Trusted Voices Network already in place. We've been doing a lot of community conversations through the 100 conversations work. So I would absolutely commit to continuing to use that methodology as we build this up and not make assumptions. Um, yes, it's a small amount of money. I think one of the things we're interested in is how would you make that go further with the aim of getting consistency? So this isn't necessarily about building big layers of service, for want of a better word. It's about using the money to try to spread and scale where we know we've got a model that's working really well. 
what could a small amount of investment do to try to strengthen collaboration, spread learning, spread in innovation? Um, and obviously, if we can ramp that up over time, because we're starting to show progress, then we'd be you know, very receptive and um, ready to sort of take on board other investment opportunities. So it's, it's, to, it's to kickstart the work, really. Um, and on the inequalities point, absolutely, Paul, I think it's really important. I didn't explicitly mention it in the paper. I think that's what I was saying when I was talking about flexibility. So to go back to the Altogether Better programme, I've just pulled up some of the stats from this. Um, by the end of the second year, we had around 27 practices fully participating, but four dropped out. The four that dropped out were almost all in areas where general practice pressure was much, much higher and they tended to be in urban areas rather than rural. Um, so we have some learning from that, uh, but absolutely this is about understanding what works best in different communities, given the resources that are on hand and what might be right for different populations. Mm -hmm. So we do definitely need to address that and I will happily work with Anita and make that more explicit. That's a really good point. I think that's covered all of the points. Thank you, Chair. Are there any uh, other comments on this? I don't think so in the room. So uh, we can agree on those recommendations very much. Also seeking people around the table and on screen to very much plug into this with the relevant organisations uh, so that we can, Cherry can, uh, with Sam and, and officers, um, start that, uh, that piece of work, really important piece of work. Great. Someone Could someone please propose that? Thank you. And seconder? Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Um, final item, exempt business. There is no exempt business. So we are done. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here today. My first sharing of